I am so thrilled to welcome my friend, my colleague, Karina Virginia. Thank you for being here at Liberate Your Authentic Self. Thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. It's nice always always such a pleasure to connect with you. And I am so, so, so grateful that you agreed to write the foreword to my new book, I Love You, Me, because we have so much in common, both from the past and what our current mission is to help this world heal and live a vibrant and healthy life. But wh- why don't we just start with, um, I don't know, some of, some of the things that we have in common. And, and I know that as, as you read through my book, I Love You, Me, you were like, wow, this, this sounds just like my story. You know, for me, it was really, really challenging and I really felt so alone for most of my life, both on the side of being what I consider deeply spiritual around people who didn't quite understand that I had these like psychic abilities that I could feel people, people's energies. But at the same time, I suffered with depression. And um, even as I got more and more successful, nobody wanted to hear that I was depressed. They were like, you should be grateful for all that you have. So I really felt isolated and alone. But what was it about my story that either resonated with you or got you, you know, sort of jazzed about being a part of this book launch? (laughs) Yeah, well, what you said right there, there were a few things, but what you said right there is, you know, completely validating of how I felt ever since I was a child. And I also had very strong spiritual awarenesses and and the ability to see beyond and I used to connect with the beyond and to explain that to other people kind of diluted it because it became sort of a fairy tale and I used to love to go to church because at church I felt so close to angels and, Mm. and God and so I thought that would be the great place for me and so I used to raise my hand in Sunday school and my Sunday school teacher would say, uh, I don't really know how to answer that question. Read it in the Bible or read it in your workbook. Yeah. And I would say, no, this is this is where I thought I'd have confirmation, right? Yeah. This is where I thought that people would understand. So it took me a really long time to recognize that it was okay to be a very deeply spiritual person and to be understood and to get to a place where I could say being understood is a little overrated anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But lots of lonely moments, lots of moments of feeling like nobody understands, lots of moments of, of people saying to me, oh, come on. Yeah. So miracles happen. Yeah. What about what happens over there at this, you know, area or what about, you know, people who are hungry or why don't you get out of la la land or, you know, all of those things that would, I would work really hard to be in this high vibration. I would feel this pull and being an empath. What happens is that if we don't seal our auric field and we don't protect ourselves energetically, those pulls become like parasites. Yeah. We start to give out so much of our energy and our love and our own connection that we don't have anything left. And then the negative comes in. And that I believe is a big component to depression. And when I started to really feel depressed, I became aware that no matter what I was doing, it wasn't getting better until I worked on the energy of it. Mm. It didn't, how many therapists or how many amazing people I spoke to, or even how much support, because I did start to get a lot of support for being who I really was as I got older. When I was younger, when I was in high school, you know, I was the cheerleader and, you know, I could play the game and, you know, fit in. But, and I was, you know, I was appreciated, but not for the real person that I was. But when I got to that place of starting to recognize that I could be appreciated for it, that pull was still there. And I didn't understand why it, you know, you look for external and then when you get external recognition, you start to say, this is what I need. This is what I thought I needed. I thought I needed people to credit me. I thought I needed fans. I thought I needed people to say, oh, wow, look at what you're doing. And thank you. No, 
Yeah. What we need is to embrace ourselves and to know that we're enough so that we don't let other people zap our energy. Yeah. So it wasn't until I did energy work that I started to really heal. Yeah, I had the exact same experience. It was, you know, all the external validation that I would seek, not not even consciously, you know, it had been so ingrained in my childhood, like you got to get good grades, you got to be a high performer, and then, you know, doing the cheerleading thing, and then it was theater, and then it was band. But I never felt like I was good enough. I still was always looking at everything I did wrong. Like, yeah, it, it was the yeah, but. Yeah, that was nice, but. Yeah, but, you know, and I would focus on the things that weren't quite right, which meant even if I was getting a 90 or a 99, I never felt that sense of joy or relief or satisfaction or pride. And into my adult life, like you, especially, you know, I know that you've done so much in the public eye and working with celebrities. And even though people could look at us and say, oh, but, you know, so-and-so calls you and you've trained this person, that doesn't fulfill the soul on the deepest level. It's like, yes, I'm doing what I'm really good at and that feels good. That's a nice validation that, that my talents are being appreciated, but that doesn't fulfill us on a spiritual level. Mm -hmm. At all. It, it really doesn't. I have a friend who was a very famous musician and um, she's, she's amazing. She's on this beautiful spiritual journey right now. And she's, finding such incredible self-love, right? But she talks about how she used to do these huge concerts and she'd have people, you know, singing with her and staring at her and bowing to her. And there'd be that one person in a huge, you know, stadium <laughs> yeah. looking at her going. And she couldn't even see anybody but that one person. So it's like if you have one person in a hundred that starts to beat you down and you're an empath, yeah. If, you, yeah. if you allow that opinion to come into the energy field, you will not even be able to see the other 99 to 100 people who adore you. And it's not any different than getting a 99 on a test instead of a hundred on the test. Why did I get one wrong, right? Yeah. So as as perfectionists and empaths it's like a double whammy and when we start to work through all of that and we start to be open with it to other people who think oh you've got it all going on you know you don't have to worry about this 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 and we start to say you don't know what it feels like yeah to be me yeah you don't know what it feels like to be so incredibly sensitive and to be so misunderstood for that sensitivity. Yeah. It's like telling someone who has a cold or who's who's prone to getting colds, it's like saying to them, just go out and don't take vitamin C, go out in the cold, it doesn't really matter. Come on, you're fine, you're healthy. Yeah. Because it's like a, we're prone to yeah. the sensitivity. And I didn't understand that about I myself. Either. I mean, I understood, yeah, I can feel people's pain, but it got to a point where it was so debilitating um, and especially when I was working at a, a women's health center and I was helping women who were either postpartum or they were coming in for like gynecological checkups and things. And I remember just leaving the place drained and emotional. And a friend of mine said, you know, and she's of course psychic and she's like, oh, honey, you've taken, you've taken some stuff on. And I was like, oh God, what do you mean? And she said, listen, you're there being compassionate, but you've got to shield and protect yourself so that you have that energy coming out of you, that compassion and that love. Sure. But you don't need to take their stuff on. And, you know, it was then that I really started to seriously look at me protecting myself energetically. So how would you teach people, you know, there are lots of empaths in my world, people who might be listening who are um, HSPs, you know, highly sensitive people who can really, truly feel the energy of other people. First of all, you're not alone. If you're listening, watching us, you are so not alone. And there are so many, there were so many times in my life where I felt like I was alone until I found a tribe of highly sensitive people. Um, but still sometimes when I'm in a very mainstream environment, 
I can still feel that feeling of not being understood and that feeling of, okay, I need to go plug into, to God. Right. So I need to go and, and do my little thing. Even if I'm at a, an event, I have to go into the bathroom and do my little thing just to plug myself back into the divine, which is where I personally find a sense of fulfillment. Gracie wants to be here with us, as you can see. Nice. So what, there's two things that I do. One is that I close my eyes and I imagine from my navel point, which in Kundalini yoga is not the belly button. It's right below the belly button, about two inches below the belly button. From that area, you imagine there being a white cord and that white cord comes out and it connects you all the way up to the heavens. Okay. And from this cord, there's this big white, um, almost like teepee. And the TP comes up over our head. So that the cord comes out. It makes a circle all the way around us. TP comes up, connects us to the divine. And we are in this protected space of light. And nobody needs to know what we're doing. And it only takes a minute. If that's not working, another thing that I do is take the hands, bring them into claws, right? Like lioness claw, <laughs> claws, right? Because we do have to be a lioness at times, mm -hmm. right? You know, we, we do have to understand that people will take advantage of us and we will be disappointed. And there are some very smart people out there who know very well how to befriend us. And even if we have a lot of discernment and even if we are super loving and kind and have a high intuition about what's going on, we are still very susceptible to those people because they're very good, they're very skilled, they're very sneaky. And so what happens to us is we're, we're very often fooled into their agenda because they know how to hook us. And the reason why we are is because we don't, we only, we're mirrors, right? So we only see in others what we can see in ourselves. And if we as empaths don't have that manipulative agenda, we don't necessarily see it in someone else. Even if we're intuitive to it, we'll say, nah, that's not really going on. This person's actually really caring and really loving me because they're exactly. using. Right. So we create the teepee. The other thing is lioness and you know, the lioness claws, they're not like, I'm going to get you. They're not defensive. They're not aggressive and they're not about, um, you know, reacting. Not at all, because that never serves. That just creates more, uh, you know, more of that stuff. We want to dissipate that energy and we want to create flow ah. and we want to create a very high frequency. So the lioness claws are protecting us. They're not hurting anybody else. They're just saying, no, I know that I'm a very heart centered person. I know I'm full of love, but you don't have any rights to come into my space and you do not have any rights to take my power away. And you can take those claws and then you can just say, namaste, right? Sat nam. So anyways, we have these claws and then what we do with them is we imagine light coming through these claws and we take them and we start to create this energy movement above the top of our head. And then we practice a breath, which is called breath of fire. And it comes in and out of the nose. So it's almost like you're a puppy <laughs> panting on a very hot day, but you close your mouth and the breath comes in and out of the nose. And you have a rhythm with that breath of fire and with this energetic clearing taking place. So you can close your eyes, you can focus at the brow point, and you can continue with the breath, visualizing the light, clearing anything energetic that's not serving you, and protecting your auric field. Okay? So you can do that for a minute, up to three minutes. And believe me, I've been in bathrooms, like in the stalls, where people probably see, like, my fingers coming up, like, that girl's crazy, you know? And then I, you know, wearing my dress, wearing my heels, you know, you know. They put a little bit of lipstick on now. So it's, it's, it's one of the best kept secrets, this little thing. Um, so that's one thing that, that we can do and then feel the, the change in the energy field. So Einstein said it, right? Everything is energy and that's all there is to it. This is my hand. These are five fingers. 
I can see these five fingers, but what I don't realize unless I'm really aware of it is that what's going on between the fingers is just as important, if not more important than what you see that's tangible. So if you think about that, we can put a nice outfit on, we can do our hair, we can put our makeup on, we can look our best, but if we haven't done our energetic clearing and we haven't worked on lifting our frequency and creating our radiant body, which is that light force, that illumination around us, then it, it, do, we're, then it doesn't matter because we're not protected. We're better off going out in sweatsuits or our Christmas pajamas after doing our meditation to stay protected and to stay radiant from our energy body then we are covering up what's really going on. The work is internal, and then the external can be the fun part. But if the internal work is not done and the energetic field is not purified, we will not feel okay. So one more thing I'd like to add to that. After you close your eyes and you've done your clearing, you can say a prayer to your angels. I often call upon Archangel Michael to cut away any energy that's in my field that is not serving me, right? To just slice it away and purify it. And then I also call upon angels to eradicate pain from the pain body in the energy field. Please take this pain away. Whether it's mine or someone else's, sometimes I don't know why I have this pain in my heart or this, this solar plexus emptiness. Please take it away. Now, the, the key is that I don't only believe, I know angels are real. I've seen them. I've had experiences with them. They're, they're right here right now. They're with all of you. So I don't question that. It's just that I don't want to forget to talk to them because they, they want us to reach out. They're just, they can't just come and be with us, right? Because we have free will. Yeah, so yeah. They, we have to call upon them. But then the next prayer after eradicating energy that's not serving me, cutting through energy that's, that's not serving me is please help me to reclaim that energy that is mine, that has been given to me as an instrument of peace and love in this world. Help me to reclaim it so that I can serve the highest good of all and help me to take that back from anybody who's taken it away from me. That's a big one. And I hate to interrupt, but when we get back from the break, I would really like to pick it up there because you've said that a couple of times about taking back our power and taking back our energy. And this is crucial for us right now. As we all know, this is a moment where women in particular and men are now speaking up about things that have happened where they have been abused, that someone else has used their power to violate them in various ways. And I would love it if we could start there about how do we take it back? Yep. All right. When we get back. Tune in daily to get fired up with insight and inspiration for purposeful living, conscious relationships, and soulful success. You're watching Liberate Your Authentic Self with me, Dr. Andrea Pennington. Check out the live version of this show where I answer your questions in real time. Visit facebook.com forward slash Dr. Andrea Pennington. So... We recognize that as much as we want to be heart-centered and we're soul-powered, there are some people hurting in this world that end up hurting us and others. And my guest today, Karina Virginia, is an empowerment guru. She is a kundalini yoga teacher. She's the author of Essential Kundalini, along with her partner, Dharam Kalsa. And Karina, you just said something before the break that I definitely want to pick up on. And that is a couple of things. One of them is sometimes we give away our power or people can suck away our power, whether they've been in a position of authority, whether it was a parent or someone else in power. There are times when we feel like we're less than and we've lost our sense of power. 
And then there are other times when we might be violated or bullied or mistreated. And that affects our energy as well. And I know you talk about energy on multiple different levels, but I'd love it if we could pick it up with this idea that you just shared with us, where you were saying we could literally do a prayer to reclaim the energy that may have been taken from us. Because I'm really, really sensitive right now that we need to have our power back for for people to speak up for people to be their authentic self, for people to create a life that is in alignment with their values and their soul's purpose. And the only way you can do that is if you have your energy and your power. Yes, absolutely. Well, there's so much that I could talk about here. So let's try to (laughs) so many things. Um, It's so important at this time that we reclaim our our grace and our power and our our mission in life. And many of us women are feeling this rumbling going on inside of us, saying, am I supposed to do something? Am I supposed to say something? Am I supposed to create change? So there's a lot I want to say about all of this. Um, first of all, as women, we are often assaulted by other women as well as men. And the assault from a spiritual woman on a spiritual woman, a spiritual woman on a very sensitive spiritual woman is so dangerous because oftentimes we will see another woman as a mother figure or a sister figure. And as empaths, we are very open to that type of connection. We long to be connected. We don't want to be separate. You know, we're like these angels flying around in heaven going, wait a minute, where's my tribe, right? Where's, and where's the matriarch angel here? So we want to see that and be with that. But if we buy into the illusion with the wrong person and we see that person as the matriarch angel or the angel sister, and they have an agenda and they sting us, It's like being a balloon that pops. Yeah. And I see this happening so often. I've experienced it too. And I don't feel, you know, my, my tendency, I give people the benefit of the doubt, but I don't feel like it was this intentional malicious thing. I think it was in their own jealousy or woundedness that they just couldn't help themselves, but to come back and... It usually is. It usually is in the shadow side of a person. And we all have a shadow side, right? So I was explaining this to someone yesterday. We, We have to have shadow sides, even if we're here as light leaders, because if we don't have that little bit of a shadow in us, we won't be able to see it in another person. Hmm. Right? So if we can forgive the shadow side of us, whatever it is, then we're able to see that someone else is, their actions are coming from their shadow side so that there can be compassion in a way that we can forgive. Now we don't forgive because we're like, Oh, you're the best. I'm going to forgive you. We forgive for ourselves because having judgment and anger and any kind of rage or disappointment just lowers our vibration. And we're all about keeping our vibration high. We're all about keeping our frequency high. So forgiveness is sort of a selfish act, right? And as empaths, we have to find some selfish acts in our toolbox. Yes. So, yeah, I agree with you. Um, I, I I don't necessarily know that there are all that many people in the world that um, hurt others consciously. I think so much of what goes on is not conscious. And it took me a really long time to get to that place. And I have been very hurt. So if we talk about any form of assault, mother nature's shaking things up right now, right? We see the fires, we see the floods, we see earthquakes. I mean, she's shaking things up. The divine feminine is coming to work with us, work through us, rumbling inside, What do I do? Do I say something? Do I not? Most important, you do what serves you. 
You don't. Mm -hmm. Well, you said before that we have angelic support. We might even have ancestral support. So it sounds like the the women and men, but the women in particular who have been silent for so long, who are now speaking up. Do you feel that we now have even more support from Mother Earth herself that's saying, "Uh -uh -uh, I'm not sitting on this negative energy anymore. I must speak up and reclaim my power, reclaim my voice. Absolutely. And that's why so many of us are feeling this calling, this rumbling, this I need to do something. And I was teaching a yoga class last week and there were there were a lot of women that were up in the front and a lot of them from, you know, a, a different generation than us. Um, a lot of them that are grandmas and, you know, have lived in the shame on you generation, which we lived in too. But you know, their generation was more of that. How dare you do that? Right. Yeah. You know, and we were doing an exercise and they started to cough as they opened their throat, they started to cough. And I just stopped the whole class. And I said, everyone close your eyes. If there's something inside of you that you aren't communicating right now and you aren't speaking, but it's hurting inside of you, raise your hand. And these women Every single one of them, they kind of did this. Oh, wow. And I said, celebrate yourself because you are awakening to where a lot of your pain is coming from. Whether you choose to use your voice or not is not what's taking place at this moment. Your healing is. And if you will heal by speaking, by all means speak. So, when I say we do it for ourselves, everything that we do for ourselves when we're living from the heart is for the highest good of all. I'll say that again. If we're doing something for ourselves, not from our ego, from our heart, from our soul, it is for the highest good of all. Mm, even if it might be painful to us, even if it might be exposing others, if it's coming from that intentional place of love and service to all. Mm, wow. Yeah. yeah. Because love, fierce love is not enabling. Fierce love is, there's a fire over there. Um, I can't <clears throat> seem to not speak. There's a fire over there. And there's going to be innocent teenagers that are going to go over there. And they don't even know. And their moms don't even know that's a fire. So what are we going to do, right? This morning I was thinking about this with, some of these beautiful mothers that I know that have these, these teenage daughters and, and the mothers are really still conditioned in that way of put it under the carpet. Don't talk about it. And a lot of these girls come to my teenage yoga classes and they say, this is what I feel. This is, but my mom doesn't understand. And so I want so much to be able to say, there's a fire. Your daughter sees the fire, right? So is that serving the highest good of all? We have to really check in with our intention there. Maybe, right? Maybe it is. And if it hurts me in that moment, am I still serving myself because I am living in my destiny and living my mission through? There is nothing worse than knowing we have a destiny and repressing it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. This one really came home to me in the last week and touched me deeply on a number of levels, which I know you, you are aware of, but let's yeah. talk about that. There is the idea of hiding who we really are and wearing that mask, putting up that facade, that fakery. And I feel like that causes an internal aching, a soul ache. There's also what you've just described, this burying or denial of our destiny, which I have experienced. I was in that whole denial. And, you know, as a writer, we talk about the hero's journey. And, you know, we get this call to adventure. And sometimes the hero says, no, 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 no. That couldn't be me. That can't be me. That can't be me. I'm not the one. No, 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 no. But I know that you, there comes a point where the, the hero gets to this point of no return, where they have to take up that heroic adventure but talk to me about what it is like for the people that you've seen and counseled and, and in, in your experience in yoga and empowerment. When we don't, when we 
stifle that energy, when we don't express it, whether it's our truth about something that happened to us or it's our truth about who we really are or what we really want to do in life, what does that energy do to us if we don't let it out? Okay, so we see Mother Nature's working through us. We see the divine feminine is very powerful at this time. What we're also seeing at this time is massive amounts of autoimmune diseases. Oh, okay. you're a medical doctor, you know. Why are the so the autoimmune diseases? I know a lot of people will say that it's environmental. Well, nothing is only environmental. It starts in the energy field way before anything. If we're in a really high frequency, we could be around asbestos and we'll be like, oh yeah, fine. You know, why are some people not prone to toxic things? And why are some people so far removed from them, but so prone to them? Okay, so now you see where I'm going. Mm -hmm. There is a calling for us to say no more. And if we don't listen to that calling, our own physical body starts to attack our own physical body. So what, what happens? Dis-ease. Look yeah. at the epidemic of Lyme disease. Look at all these things. You know, every single person that I know who has healed from Lyme has healed energetically. Hmm. There's a Dr. Klinghard. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He's from Europe. But there's, I studied a lot of his theories on the five levels of healing, the five stages of healing, and how it's all in the energy body. I have seen people who were on their deathbeds heal by healing their energy body. And in this energy body is also imprints from our ancestors. So if I've been assaulted and I'm not speaking out, I'm not speaking out for seven generations back. If my ancestors are working through me and, the, and Mother Nature's working through me, you can count on those angels saying, this is your time. I couldn't do it. You can and you do it for your daughter, your granddaughter, et cetera, et cetera, or your son, right? It's, it's male and female. So what happens is we don't understand why we can't just keep quiet, like maybe even our mothers taught us to be. And so we keep repressing it and putting it down and putting it down. And then <clears throat> my throat's sore, <clears throat> I'm coughing, something's going on with my thyroid, Hashimoto's disease, um, you name it. The, the energy doctors are full right now trying to heal these things. So would you then recommend that people see an energy psychologist or an energy healer? I mean, what about kundalini yoga and some of the other things that you do? Well, kundalini yoga is so incredibly powerful because it's, it gives us the ability to heal ourselves. It gives us the ability to heal our own energy body. And that's why I dedicated three years of my life to writing that book with my co-writer. But, you know, and, and my husband is extremely mainstream. Um, he's a lawyer in New York City. And when we first met, I was such a yogi, I would hide like my kundalini yoga because it's all chanting and, you know, a lot of stuff going on energetically. And I saw such a miracle in him when he saw how amazing the the yoga was working on me and so many students that would just come over and, and say you know what happened to me when I started doing this that now my husband is completely 100% on board I love with, it it works it works on so many different layers that we don't necessarily understand so yeah there's a lot of different ways of, of healing energetically some people go for acupuncture um, massage, Reiki, you know, there's a lot of different, different ways you have to find what works for you. But when you start doing a lot of the healing work, you're really integrating mind, body and soul so much that you are kind of given this moment of being the spiritual warrior. And where you actually say, wow, I'm healing and now I'm being called to help others heal. And that might mean 
that your voice is needed. Wow. I think that is huge because I've seen that in a lot of the people that I work with. And I just wondered if maybe, oh, they're just coming because, yeah, I do this branding and marketing, so it makes sense. But it's as though their healing has empowered them in new ways that they never thought. Some of the people I work with never anticipated they would be an author or be giving TED Talks, but they realized there was this almost a spiritual imperative. So I'd like to, when we get back from the break, I'd like to talk about life after the healing. Yeah. Because when okay. we go beyond trauma, when we go beyond abuse, and we finally um, are willing and ready to heal, I think there's a critical element about permission. So I'd love to get your take on how people can give themselves permission to finally be happy and healthy and have a life when we yeah. get back. You're watching Liberate Your Authentic Self with me, Dr. Andrea Pennington. Check me out on Instagram at Dr. Andrea Pennington. And now back to the show. Most of us think that the only thing that really matters in life is being happy or healthy or being able to pursue a life that you really, really love. But what if you feel like you don't deserve that? Well, I'd like to talk about what happens after healing and really coming to terms with, you know, whatever drama or trauma has happened in our past. How do we give ourselves permission to really live life to the fullest. My guest, Karina Virginia, is an empowerment guru. She's an, a kundalini yoga teacher and the author of Essential Kundalini Yoga. Karina, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I know we could talk for hours, and I know we will be talking for hours in February when, when I join you in California um, teaching a beautiful workshop at 1440 Multiversity. But for this show, for this moment, I really want to talk about this idea of getting to life after, life after the healing has happened. Because I, I recognized when I was working with some people with eating disorders and some people who had addiction, that after all of this stuff you're talking about, like we had a psychologist, we had massage, we had a salon to help people start feeling good in their body as they lost weight or they got off of substances. We did acupuncture, we did meditation, we did breath work. I mean, we were doing this stuff and we even had, I even have a, you know, a lovely angel healer who worked in my practice. So I feel like we really were covering all the bases, but there were a small subset of my patients that wouldn't get better or they'd switch addictions, or they'd find some other way to like sabotage their well-being. And as I dug, I found out they didn't believe that they deserved happiness or that vitality. So I want to I want to hear from you how we can help people give themselves permission to love themselves enough to have a fabulous life. Mm. I think what you just brought up is so common. And I've been thinking about this a lot this year. Um, after speaking up about something and then needing to heal myself, um, when I started to feel all these sorts of emotions come over me and I was doing everything that I knew helped and those emotions wouldn't seem to dissipate, one day I sat down and I said, and this, this is so emotional, I might even get teary-eyed talking to all of you about it, but I really want to help people who are here. I said to myself, where's that little girl? Where's that little girl who disrupted the class in school, who was told not to interrupt, who was told to sit still, who was told to be a good girl like all the other girls. And so I said, I want to talk to her. And I, I took this day, of, it was a really hard day, and I took the day after I got my kids to school to sit, play some mantra, light some candles, burn some incense, and do this work. And what I realized was that this little girl was just sitting there crying. And I said, oh, it's you. No wonder why 
I'm still feeling all of this. It's you, you need to heal. So I started muscle testing myself to find out how old I was. And I realized that it started at about three and a half when my little sister was born. And at that point, of t in that, at that time, I really, I had so much to say. And I, I remember that I used to see angels. And I remember that even my, my parents' friends would come over and they'd be like, okay. And then they'd go to the baby and I'd say, do you want to talk about the, oh, okay, you know. And it started then of this, this almost shame for being too loud or for waking up the baby or for trying to get attention for someone to listen to me. And then I saw it going on as I got older and when I was in school and I would sit in school and the teachers would be talking about, you know, okay, so this is the block and this is the other color. If you put these two together, what color do you have? And I would sit there and I can remember and I sit because I'm sitting now because that's often how I, I even um, tune into the divine. So I can remember sitting in circle time. And this is what's so interesting because circle time now is so needed for women, especially, and men. Right. Any wants to be in a circle. We need that circle. So I started thinking circle time. Circle time for me when I was in kindergarten was the worst because I'd look at the teacher talking about this color and this, and I'd raise my hand and she would look right past me and she would say, okay, someone else, you know, yes, it makes purple. And I would say, can we talk about something else? Can, and then I would get in trouble because I broke the crayons. Uh -huh. Now, it's, it, this whole story goes on and on and on. But what it helped me to realize is that last year I said something that needed to be said and it disrupted a whole system, okay? And we're seeing this happening a lot. Now, I had to say it. I have no regrets about saying it. It needed to be done. It was definitely um, a calling from a much higher realm and it was a choice of say it or get sick. But I knew I had to say it and then heal. But what I realized when I wasn't healing as fast as I needed to heal was that that little girl was being told, I said, sit still. I said, don't interrupt the class. You broke the crayons. I know, but those crayons needed to be broken. Why? Because Sam wanted one and so did Jennifer. So I wanted to share. We don't break crayons but I don't see it that way. It doesn't matter how you see it. That's not what we do. Wow. We want everybody to be happy. But Jessica is sitting there crying. I want to give her something. Well, too bad for Jessica. You just need to sit and be quiet. So I learned, okay, I need to be quiet. And what does that do? You imploded. And I was a very sad child. Yeah. So to answer your question, when we sabotage ourselves and we've been given so many beautiful gifts from the angels for healing, that means it's time to do some serious, and I don't mean gentle little, I mean deep, heart-wrenching inner child work. And when we do that inner child work, we can really break through the glass ceiling. I'm so glad you're saying it. I'm so glad you're putting it in that light because what I also noticed was some people would say, I don't know why I'm not getting better. Oh, that, that abuse. Oh, that, that sexual trauma that happened. Oh, I've already been to therapy about that. I've already, I've already dealt with that. But what I also noticed, what, and you know this because it's in my book, I noticed that people did have to go back and do the inner child work, even though it wasn't the three or five-year-old that was you know, abused they are still grieving because they had a similar wound, even if it wasn't the exact same type of abuse or, you know, whatever. So I'm so glad that you're bringing this up because I think people do think, oh, no, it couldn't be that. Oh, no, no, I dealt with that in, in college. Oh, no, no, I dealt with that in therapy. But there's this inner, very tender part of us that needs to be heard, that needs to grieve, that needs to feel the adult us or some other compassionate figure that can come in hear them out and give them the healing space so that they can, we can move on. Right. Absolutely. And can help us to say to that child 
I know you broke the crayons and I know everybody thought that you were really naughty. And I know that you were told you were really naughty, but I know you broke the crayons because you love people. And I know what your true intention was. And I just think you are so wonderful and I love you so much. And I forgive you for breaking those crayons. In fact, I thank you for breaking those crayons. And when we have that conversation with our inner child, and then we bring that child back in, what happens is the lowest frequency emotion, which we know is shame, shame is even lower than fear, right? That lowest frequency emotion starts to dissipate because we realize it's not my fault. In fact, I'm going to start to celebrate that I'm disrupting a system that needs to be disrupted because I am helping other people learn how to do it. Yes, and how yes. many children out there broke crayons or whatever they did, right? And you naughty, naughty girl, shame on you. You should be ashamed of yourself. Those messages, yeah. right? The teachers, even our generation, our teachers. Oh, yeah. I'm going to call your mother. You should be ashamed of yourself. And then other, even our friends' mothers, right? You're a naughty girl. You go in the room and all the other kids can play and you're not allowed to play with them because you're a bad girl. So when something happens to us as an adult, there's this very subconscious belief that it's our fault. Yep. And then it carries over into other areas of our life. And you and I have talked about this in terms of intimate relationships. You know, mm -hmm. I saw women while I was researching my other book, The Orgasm Prescription, that they said, no, 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 I, 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 it'll take me too long to experience orgasm or I have to have the lights off or all these different things. And it was like, where did that shame come from? Even though it was in a completely different realm, it wasn't sexual issues, but it was that lingering sense of shame that you're not entitled to pleasure, that you have to hurry up. Other people's um, pleasure or satisfaction is more important than yours. Like, oh my gosh, it's so pervasive. And then it leaks into everything else we do in our intimate lives as parents, as business uh, and entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs in the world. Yes, so much. And so much shame for women is stuck in the lower chakras, the lower triangle, the first chakra, the second chakra, and the third chakra. So I'm just going to kind of stand up here. So if shame is like in this area here, right? Oftentimes women will think something must have happened to me when I was a child. I must have been, you know, assaulted or, or, or something. I must have been abused or something must have happened to me sexually, but I can't remember it. Well, yeah, I'm sure many, many have been, but there's a lot of women that actually weren't necessarily assaulted by touch in their private area that are feeling such a sense of shame, that are having a hard time with conception, are not able to get pregnant, or are miscarrying, or are not enjoying sexuality, are not allowing themselves to be sensual, and they think it's some sort of trauma that happened to them sexually. Well, these chakras are our sexual chakras, especially the womb area is our sexual home. So if we're feeling shame because we broke the crayons, right, or anything like that, we might mistake it for a form of sexual assault. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. I mean, because I think even when I was studying Chinese medicine, like the, everything is interconnected and that energy Energy, you know, energy can neither be uh, created nor destroyed. It just moves around. And so feeling repressed or feeling, you know, whatever it is where we redirect energy instead of speaking out or getting that healing, that energy can go elsewhere. And when it's blocked and that creates this dis-ease or this illness or what have you, um, I could totally see how, how one could misinterpret that, oh, no, there must have been something that happened to me because... You know, I can't, t I can't feel anything there anymore. And is this something that, um, that you will be able to help us through when we get to 1440 Multiversity out in California? Absolutely. Absolutely. This, we'll be working so much on the second chakra. 
and we'll start to make so much sense of things. Even the moments where, you know, we remember that somebody, you know, grabbed us inappropriately, like groped our butt or something, right? And then we start to say to ourselves, you know, I, I hear this so much from women, but I wasn't raped, so maybe it's not that big of a deal. But he still grabbed my butt, and I still think maybe it was my fault. Well, in a sense, what your energy body is telling you is the same as being raped because it's an assault on your shame. It's an assault on your pain. It's mm. an assault on so many things that you haven't healed yet. So there's, you know, the, we're, we have to be really careful with words and we have to be really careful with judgment and we have to be really careful with, well, this is worse than this because everybody is made up differently. We all have different genetics. We all feel things differently. We all have come into this world with different imprints, different DNAs to work through different things. We have belief systems that come through our lineage. So one person might handle one thing so well and look at someone else who can't seem to cope and not understand. Well, we have to stop doing that and we have to just embrace everybody and say, what you're feeling is big because you're feeling it and it's preventing you from living a happy life. So it's big and I'm validating that what you're feeling is big. Oh, really? So someone just touched your face and it to you it feels like it was something compared to what someone else is talking about that is just horrendous. Yeah. Well, you have to embrace and validate. And for you and me to be there and to validate others and say, okay, this happened to you. And yeah, you know what? This is huge. And we're going to help you to forgive the entire situation, including yourself, to clear those blocks. And we'll be using it, Kundalini Yoga to really clear the energy blocks so that we can, we can do what we're supposed to be doing, which is live a life full of joy and happiness. It's our birthright to be happy. And it's time. It's so time for us to feel good. Yes, it is. I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> I know, me too. And we'll get to <laughs> and, and we will get to. Karina, thank you so much. This has been enlightening and affirming even for me on so many levels. And I, I pray that everyone who's listening or watching has also been touched by it. If you want to learn more about the lovely Karina and sign up for some of her love notes that she sends out via email, visit KarinaVirginia.com and definitely get a copy of Essential Kundalini Yoga because she's illustrated very beautifully these photos that um, just really show us how we can use kundalini to heal ourselves. And once again, I thank you, Karina, for sharing the, the forward to my new book, I Love You, Me, which is my journey from depression to finding real self-love. So I thank you. I thank you, my sister. And I look forward to seeing you soon. And I thank you, and I look so forward to seeing you too, and I just adore you. And to all your fans that are watching, you are so lucky to have this beautiful woman in your life. What a gift from God. Bless you all. It was yes. lovely to meet all of you. I embrace you all, and I send you all so much love from my heart. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Get your copy of I Love You, Me, my personal journey to overcoming depression, and finding real self-love within. It includes the five-step cornerstone process for building a foundation of real self-love. You get free gifts with your purchase. And I invite you to join the Real Self-Love Movement. This is a free community of inspiration and support. Download the I Love You Me Manifesto to remind yourself of just how perfect and powerful you really are. Visit realself.love.com 